name is Olivia Hari Harangat, like Kristen said. Um, I haven't had the chance to meet many of you. I started at the beginning of um, 2022, and it's wonderful to be a part of Talking Torps Labor and Employment Group, and I'm excited to present to you today. As Kristen mentioned, um, Carly and I have split up this topic, the hybrid workplace, because it is a big one. Um, there are lots of potential things that we could talk about today. We are not going to cover them all, but we're going to give it our best shot. So let's get going. A little bit of an overview for you. I think it's fun to start with a bit of a sense of the current state of hybrid work. I'm going to show you some stats, see what people are thinking and feeling about hybrid work uh, moving forward. Then I'm going to talk with you about employee monitoring and surveillance, which is not necessarily new, but has increased. Um, in this era of increased remote work. And then Carly's going to take over and she's going to discuss remote work agreements and policies and some other jurisdictional issues that come up for folks who are working in a hybrid model. So that is where we're going today. Um, to start, let's chat a bit about the state of hybrid work. I think this is something we're all curious about personally and for our organizations. Um, what people are going to want moving forward. So there's some interesting statistics out there. Um, this is a Gallup poll that was done. And this is um, sort of current and anticipated employee work locations for remote capable jobs. I think some of the more interesting statistics to compare um, are looking at work the fully on-site work location pre-pandemic was at 60%. And if you look all the way over right-hand bottom corner, it looks like folks of only about 9% of people want to be fully on site in the future. So that's sort of the biggest gap I'm seeing um, in this chart. I don't think it's particularly surprising to anyone who's been working in an office setting as of late that a lot of people have decided they prefer some sort of hybrid model. They don't wanna be fully on site all the time, except for those 9%. Um, otherwise, there's pretty large consensus that most people, 59%, want to you know, be, some sort of hybrid model. And then there's about a good a good chunk, 32%, who would prefer to be fully remote. Um, I don't think these are super surprising numbers, but informative nonetheless. A way of looking at the same um, information, if given the option to work partially remote, uh, how often would people prefer to work at the office? Um, again, some interesting statistics here. Looks like four in 10 want to be in two to three days a week, and um, three in 10 want to be in the office less than two days a week. So there's sort of a critical mass there hovering around two ish to three ish days in office. Again, anecdotally, that's sort of been my experience, but it's interesting to see this data um, on a wider scale. Um, and then at the fringes, you've got some folks who want to be primarily in office and some who rarely want to be in office. Um, additionally, a big question that's been sort of moving through Tonkin and other businesses is if we're going to have a remote hybrid style workplace, how are we going to organize that? Um, according to this data, there's about six in 10 who agree that there should be some level of coordination about when people are coming into the office, but folks can't agree about what that coordination looks like. Um, about 24% are excited if the employer would require a certain number of days a week for folks to be on site. 16% um, say they want their team um, to be on site on the same days. Um, and then 22% is saying they want folks all to be together for at least one day a week. Um, and then four in 10, which is still a sizable you know, amount of people, prefer to have total autonomy, uh, autonomy about when they, when they come in. So I think there's gonna be some interesting conversations here about if we're using a hybrid work model, how are we organizing that in order to maximize the benefits of a hybrid model while also maintaining company culture and collaboration? Um, so these are hot topics that a lot of people are. And last chart before I get into some more details, this was just kind of interesting. Um, it's a comparison by generation of people's preferences about where they're where they're working. Frankly, I was surprised that there weren't bigger differences in these three columns. Um, particularly for full-time in office, it's pretty much hovering right around 13% of people, according to this poll, who want to be fully in office regardless of your generation, which is interesting. Um, obviously, we're seeing some bigger differences there in the light blue, which represents folks who want to be in one to two days um, per week. But 
most people have decided that full-time office work is, you know, not for them across the generations. Interesting statistics um, to start the morning. And again, anecdotally seems to align with what I'm hearing internally here at Tonkin and from, from clients as well. Um, let's move on to my second topic, which is employee monitoring and surveillance. So like I mentioned at the beginning, um, people have been er, monitoring their employees for a long time. What we're seeing now is an uptick in that monitoring because people are working fully remote and also there's improved some to monitor these things. So some examples of employee monitoring. Probably know about keystroke and mouse monitoring, essentially just keeping track of how much you're typing, how much your mouse is moving. You may have also heard about how people are getting around these technologies by ordering mouse jigglers um, that basically keep their mouse moving even when they're not at the desk. Um, there's also some programs which will actually take screenshots of, of the workers' work throughout the day to make sure that they're working on work-related stuff. Um, some of the more intensive monitoring systems will actually use a laptop's built-in camera to take photos of, of workers throughout the day, which is a, definitely a newer technology. Um, and then there's also folks who are monitoring idle time, which is just sort of the inverse of the keystroke and mouse monitoring systems. Um, and then kind of older um, styles of monitoring would include, you know, reviewing email communications and keeping tabs on what people are doing on the internet. So those are less new, some of these more um, specialized monitoring systems and softwares are newer and we're seeing them being used a lot more as people are working hybrid or fully remote. Um, and the reason I wanna talk about employee monitoring today is because there's a lot of laws that are implicated by these programs. Um, and some of them, many of them sort of fall outside of the typical employment law umbrella and therefore might not be at the forefront of our brains. Um, so I think it's worth diving in a bit to the laws that are implicated. The three I wanna to cover today are wiretapping laws, um, claims for invasion of privacy, and monitoring um, specific laws, which we've seen an uptick. Um, so let's start off with wiretapping, which admittedly is like the most complicated and most technical of the three. Hoping you all have had some coffee this morning and you're ready to dig in. So. Um, before I get into the nitty gritty of the of the federal wiretapping law, um, it's probably good to just talk a bit more about generals, um, general topic or general themes. First of all, when we talk about wiretapping, the example, the classic example I'm thinking of is something from like a mystery movie where there's two criminals that are talking over the phone and then someone picks up a third phone and is listening in and transcribing whatever the conversation is between the two, the two criminals. Um, that is wiretapping. Obviously that's not as relevant in the employment context. Um, the situations that are more common for us in this room today would be things like this webinar that we're recording today. Um, recording educational webinars, recording internal Zoom or Teams meetings, or recording um, phone calls between, between employees. Um, so that's where this is gonna come up more often for us. Um, so that's sort of what I'm talking about when I say wiretapping. It's a broader concept, um, which also includes this sort of, what I call eavesdropping, which is where basically a couple of folks are chatting in a room and there's a third person or a fourth person who's listening in, but isn't part of the conversation. Wiretapping and eavesdropping laws kind of go hand in hand. Um, they're both sort of monitoring and um, prohibiting the same conduct, which is listening in or recording on something that you don't have consent for. Um, but that's the overall topic. And like I said, I think this comes up most frequently when we're trying to record internal meetings or record phone calls, um, particularly now that we're relying on Zoom. So that's what I mean when I say wiretapping um, laws, eavesdropping laws. I think another important point about this area is that these are criminal statutes. Um, so they fall far outside of our usual employment world. And that means they carry criminal liability if, um, if you break them. So that's why it's important to talk about these, to be aware of these and to know how to avoid breaking them. Um, so that's an important thing to note. As I mentioned, 
wiretapping laws are really technical, very complex, and they vary by state. When you're talking about conversations between two people, oftentimes over Zoom or phone, often those folks are in different places. So not only are you dealing with laws that are complicated in your own state, but you're also having to ensure compliance with other states' laws as well. Um, so as you can see, this gets layered and can be complicated, but I have sufficiently frightened you. There are pretty straightforward solutions to avoid um, breaking these laws, and we'll get into those as we move along. So um, all that to say, let's, let's just dive into the federal wiretapping law. Um, the Federal Wiretap Act generally prohibits a person from intercepting or in uh, attempting to intercept any wire, oral, or electronic communication and then from disclosing the contents of that conversation, communication. So that's you know pretty straightforward. You can't intercept or try to intercept some sort of communication, whether it be over a wire, telephone, um, Zoom, et cetera. And you can't disclose that unlawfully intercepted communication. Um, you can record for our purposes such a uh, communication if you get the consent to do so from at least one person, one party who's participating in the communication. Um, so frequently that one person who consents is gonna be the person who's recording and that's sufficient under federal law. As we'll see, that's not enough under state law, uh, but this is sort of the baseline where we can start. And there's several states who follow this federal model, which is only one party needs to consent. And then there's a whole nother group of states which follows a different model, which requires that everybody consent. Um, so this is an example of that one party consent model, which is. Um, I'll quickly note there's a lot of exceptions to the Federal Wiretap Act and the other wiretap statutes that I just don't have time to get into today. Um, I'm going to keep it sort of focused on what you need to know as an employer. But as you can imagine, there's exceptions for law enforcement, that sort of thing. So just something to be aware of. A part to the Federal Wiretapping Act, it's called the Stored Communications Act, um, and that basically has certain requirements for um, the storage of electronic communications. It's basically geared towards companies that are like email servers and are holding on to data from a bunch of different companies, but just know that that Stored Communications Act is a subpart of the Federal Wiretapping Laws, um, but as long as you're internally accessing your own um, you know, your own data within your own policies, um, emphasis on in line with your own policies, um, it, it shouldn't be an issue, um, but that is a component of federal wiretapping laws to be. To be. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about the laws in Oregon, Washington, and California, because like I said, we're often chatting with folks who are outside of our state, and it's probably most likely that we're talking to people on the West Coast. So um, in Oregon, we have kind of an interesting wiretapping law model. Um, that depends on the medium by which you're communicating. So if you're in person or you're talking over Zoom or Teams like we are today, then everybody has to um, be informed that the conversation is being recorded to be in compliance with these laws. So that's why Kristen had that beautiful announcement at the beginning of this presentation and why we provided you notice in writing beforehand, among other checks um, to make sure everybody is aware of the fact that this is being recorded today. If, if you're talking with someone by radio or phone, then it's just one person that needs to consent to the recording. So Oregon's kind of an interesting state because it has some elements, elements of the one party consent model and some elements of um, the two party consent model. But for our purposes, if you're recording Zoom meetings, if you're recording phone calls, even phone calls, I think it's smart to just say that they're being recorded regardless of medium um, to make sure that everybody is aware of that. Um, in Washington, uh, everybody has to consent to the recording regardless of how that communication or conversation is happening. Um, what's interesting in Washington is um, that the announcement that the um, communication is going to be recorded should itself be recorded. So again, that's part of why we started the recording. Kristen made her announcement and then we continued. So that sort of 
um, element is specific to Washington, but it's a super smart thing to incorporate across the board, even if you're not chatting with folks um, in Washington. So again, in Washington, everybody has to has to consent and you need to make an announcement at the beginning on the same recording that a recording is about to follow. And then California. Um, California has two laws, one that's wiretapping and one that's eavesdropping, which eavesdropping is that model where someone is like outside of the room sort of eavesdropping on other folks having a conversation, but they themselves are not part of the conversation. Um, although they have different statutes in California, um, you need consent from any, everybody regardless of whether it's categorized as, as um, wiretapping or eavesdropping. So I think that's the most important takeaway is again, California requires that everybody consent to any sort of um, recording, be it over phone, Zoom, in person. I think too, it's worth thinking about not only you as the employer initiating the recording, oftentimes we're seeing employees doing the recording, right? So sometimes surreptitiously, they don't realize that this is an issue. They're perhaps recording their the meeting on their telephone or they're videoing the video of the Zoom meeting. Um, so I think it's worthwhile to explain this to your um, to your staff and perhaps have a Zoom policy which we can help you formulate so that everybody's in agreement about what recording looks like and what is required to do so. Um, and oftentimes this will come up, you know, without any malintent. Um, employees are just better audio learners, for example, they want to be able to look or listen back at the meeting that they just had for whatever reason, but just frankly aren't aware that um, notice needs to be given before they can record these sorts of meetings. Um, like I said, we are happy to help if you'd like to develop that sort of policy um, to make sure that everybody knows how to properly comply with these laws. Move on. So as I mentioned, um, Invasion of privacy. Oregon, Washington, and California all have um, employees in those states can all bring invasion of privacy claims against their employer. There's a, a lot of requirements for an employee to win on that claim. Um, but for our purposes, the most important element that the employee has to prove is that they had a reasonable expectation of privacy um, that was breached. A way we can buffer against that as the employer is saying that you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, particularly in things like work email accounts or work technology, right? So that can be in our policies and we can make announcements about that. Um, when those things are in place, courts generally have agreed that employees are less likely to have a reasonable expectation of privacy, um, but it's important that those things are spelled out in a policy and communicate to employees. Um, a big caveat, of course, is there are places in the office where someone does have a reasonable expectation of privacy, like, you know, restrooms, locker rooms, that sort of thing, um, about those areas. But um, for employers to make announcements that, you know, you don't have privacy in your work, sort of insulate against potential invasion of privacy claims. All right, and then there's also sort of a new wave of employee monitoring specific laws. So these are laws that states are passing in sort of um, direct reaction to the increase in employee monitoring softwares and technologies. At this point, we've got New York, Connecticut, and Delaware that have already passed this kind of law. Um, and they have their own sort of elements, but basically they require the employee or employer, excuse me, to provide notice that they're using these employee mon or monitoring practices, um, and oftentimes a lot also require that the employer explain why they're using them. California has proposed a more comprehensive bill that hasn't yet passed, um, and also the National Labor Relations Board, which is kind of Kristen's territory, has recently published a memo in which it's promising to crack down on monitoring and surveillance that interfere with an employee's um, section seven rights. So the rights to like self-organize, form unions, to collectively bargain, discuss employment conditions, et cetera. Um, it's important to know that all employees have section seven rights. It's not just union employees. 
Um, so even, you know, it's something to be aware of, even if you don't work in a unionized workplace, that the National Labor Relations Board is taking a hard look at super intensive monitoring techniques um, with an eye toward protecting employees' Section 7 rights. So with this wave of new laws being passed and the NLRB publishing this memo, we can only anticipate that more laws are likely to come. So it's something to keep an eye out for moving forward. And some takeaways. Um, basically, let's say you only want to record meetings if you need to do so, and there's a legitimate business purpose for doing it. Um, if you do want to record, I think it's best to provide written advance notice that the meeting will be recorded. So perhaps that's in the, you know, in the meeting invite itself, perhaps it's in the email you send around. Even better if you can secure um, written advanced consent to the recording, which is why we incorporated that in part of our registration process here today. Um, I think uh, the other big one is announcing that the presentation will be recorded at the beginning of the presentation. Like I said, that's a requirement in Washington, but is a good idea across the board, should be a normal practice. Um, and make sure, like I said, you're recording that announcement. And then also, um, I think this is probably standard, but if it's not, you wanna make sure that the Zoom function is turned on, which prompts participants to actively consent to the recording. Um, if the person doesn't consent, they're kicked out, but um, I think it's good to make sure that function is turned on when you're planning to record. And um, you can pull a report directly from Zoom, which indicates which participants have clicked that button and consent. Another great way to show that you've crossed your T's and dotted your I's on that front. Um, I think it's also a good idea to disclose monitoring systems that you're using and explain why you're using them, even though in Oregon, Washington, and California, it's not necessarily required by law yet. I think it's a good practice to be um, open. And lastly, you know, you, you want to reiterate in your policies that employees don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy on their work devices, work email, that sort of thing. Um, and like I said, we're happy to help you um, draft policies to meet all these needs, whether it be related to Zoom and meeting recordings, whether it be related to um, expectations of privacy, et cetera. Um, that's all I have. That was a lot to take in at 8.30 in the morning. But thank you for hanging with me, working through some sort of technical nitty gritty stuff. Hopefully you have some clear takeaways from this slide that you can use moving forward. And with that, I'm happy to pass it along to Carly. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Olivia. Uh, my name is Carly Bacon. And um, today I'll be shifting our focus a bit um, to more just remote work in general. Um, and so specifically, we're going to be talking about uh, potential policy considerations um, and agreements for you to put in place for your employees. And, you know, I know here it is the end of 2022 um, remote work at this point for some of your workforces might seem like old hat. I mean, we've been doing this for a while, um, but with 2023 just around the corner, it's a great time to update employee handbooks. Um, maybe you don't have an, a written policy for remote or hybrid work in place. Um, and so I thought, let's uh, get into it and go over some different policy considerations. Um, so there are uh, a whole spectrum of options that you can uh, choose from. Um, obviously some workers are fully remote. Uh, some may be hybrid coming into the office and staying at home. Um, Maybe you have the type of workforce where some people are uh, in the office constantly while others have different situations. Um, some are fully in person. Um, if that's you, feel free to ignore the remaining 20 minutes of this presentation. Um, so, you know, obviously every workplace is different um, and there may be a lot of different options going on. Um, so with that in mind, you know, there's no one size fits all policy. Um, instead, it's uh, up to you, and if you choose to work with legal counsel, um, seeking guidance from them, um, go through and think about what your workplace requires, what your needs are, um, and then have a good written policy put in place. Because, you know, no matter which options you choose for remote work, it's a great idea to have a written policy going over it, um, you know, for all the obvious reasons, right, which is to maintain consistency, 
set expectations for employees, um, give employees a fair idea of what your responsibilities as their employer are going to be, um, and also uh, maybe refer to other policies that you have in place that are relevant to them when they work remotely. Um, so we'll be going over kind of a lot during this presentation because I want to touch on a, a lot of different considerations. I won't spend too much time on each individual one. Um, it's more of a sampling. Um, so with that, let's move on uh, to one of the first policy pointers that we have, um, which pertains to eligibility. Um, so you may be, or your employees may be asking themselves whether they're even eligible to work remotely. Um, maybe you wanna have a process put into um, place where they need to make requests. We'll, we'll talk about those in just a moment. Um, and where you're approving on a case by case basis, whether or not they, they can work remotely. So it's a good idea to put into your policy some sort of note pertaining to their eligibility. Um, and so for example, um, maybe you want to, for new hires, um, you want to put some sort of time period in place. Maybe only employees who have been working for you for 60 days or 90 days or some other period of time are eligible to work remotely. That way, of course, you can assess their performance, uh, make sure it's a good fit before you set them loose to work from home. And um, obviously, you know, as I mentioned during the introduction, maybe certain jobs um, just don't work in the remote work uh, world. Um, of course, like security officers or um, employees uh, in your staff, like in the office who need to be performing um, all of the routine day-to-day -day tasks like printing, copy, and that sort of thing. Obviously, they can't do that from home. So thinking about which jobs are eligible. Um, and then even within certain jobs, uh, which job duties. Um, so just defining those kind of things for employees to make sure it's clear um, who's eligible and who's not. Um, another consideration would be for uh, different types of workers um, who are either full-time, part-time, maybe you have temporary workers in your workforce. Um, so it's also a good idea to just set out in the policy um, which of those are eligible as well. Um, so another little reminder here, this might be a good time for employers to update their job descriptions as well. Um, later on in the uh, presentation today, Lorena will be talking about ADA considerations. Um, so this sort of feeds into that a little bit, um, but having a good job description in place and identifying what essential job functions are, um, including whether attending work in person is an essential job function. Um, that can be a really fact intensive inquiry. Um, and so that's something we do recommend you would seek legal counsel on. Um, so just gonna make a quick plug for that. Um, so once you've defined eligibility in your policy, um, another thing to consider is, do you want to have employees um, make specific requests or uh, maybe you prefer to have a, a blanket policy of, you know, anybody within this job category gets to work remotely. It's just sort of an announcement company-wide and, it, and it's an expectation. Um, plenty of employers have that more flexible approach, um, but the upshot to having a formal request procedure in place is that as an employer, you maintain discretion over which employees get to work remotely and which don't. Um, if you do choose to go with a request procedure, um, it may be worthwhile for you to consider using a standard form. Um, what information you choose to request from employees, um, you, you might look at, of course, uh, their, their tenure, their job uh, position, um, those kinds of things. Um, it's a good idea to have a request in writing as opposed to verbally, um, just for your own record keeping purposes. Um, if you do go through a request process, so as opposed to just having a blanket expectation that certain employees can work remotely, if you're in the realm of a request process, um, it's a really good idea to include your human resources department within that process. Or if you don't have a formal HR department, then um, maybe multiple supervisors or managers involved in the process um, so that there's uh, more of a consistent review in place. Um, and this is just to um, 
try to prevent any sort of discrimination and retaliation concerns. Because, um, of course, a lot of people love to work from home. And if an employer is picking and choosing which employees are able to work from home and which are not, um, you know, even if the employer has the eligibility defined in their written policy um, and, you know, accept or decline requests based on those factors, you may still have disgruntled employees who feel that they should get to work from home for whatever the reason might be. Um, and, you know, in their minds, maybe it could be something that's discriminatory uh, based on their age or their race or some other protected characteristic, or perhaps, you um, recently in time, they made some sort of um, complaint um, or participated in a company investigation. Um, and so now being declined the opportunity to uh, work remotely to them might feel retaliatory. Um, so by including HR or having other people involved in the review process, um, not just having it be within the discretion of one supervisor um, is a good idea to try to uh, alleviate those kinds of things. Um, another thing you might consider within the uh, eligibility and request process in your policy is implementing a trial period. So just like with having a minimum eligibility tenure before approving requests and um, having an employee uh, work remotely for maybe 60 days, 90 days, and then assess their performance at the end of that time. Um, and in the meantime, also maybe having uh, specific uh, check-ins, like weekly check-ins with their manager so that you're keeping close tabs on their performance um, and of course documenting those things so that at the end of the trial period, you can make an assessment of whether or not that remote work situation um, is working well for them and for you as their employer and if any adjustments need to be made. Um, so a trial period is another thing you might consider for your policy. Um, and then finally within the request uh, realm, um, what kind of approval process you want to have in place. Um, you know, we would recommend that um, if you were to have your request in writing, it might be a good idea to also have your approvals in writing. Um, and then you also might want to consider implementing a written remote employment agreement. Um, Again, that, you know, that really formalizes the process. At this point now, we're talking about multiple documents um, in place for this, but um, especially in the situation where you maybe have employees who work out of state or even out of the country where they're not being supervised and not regularly reporting to the workplace. Um, so maybe you're fully remote employees, for instance. Um, having that employment agreement in place um, just further solidifies the expectations that you have for them. Um, and, you know, it's just excellent record keeping. So that's something you might want to consider implementing as well. Um, so moving on, um, well, actually not moving on, this is still part of the request process. Um, you want to be sure to exclude um, any sort of accommodation requests. Um, and so that's something that, um, as an employer, it's a good idea to check in with your HR folks, definitely uh, check in with your, your supervisors and your management um, so that they uh, are mindful of employee requests to work remotely that might actually be um, requests to work remotely based on either a disability that the employee has um, or even a, a religious practice. Um, you might be thinking like, well, what could that possibly be? Um, you know, for example, if an employee uh, has a really um, strict prayer schedule, for instance, and maybe they request to work remotely so that they can um, go through their prayer schedule at home and, and have what they need there. So um, just being mindful that um, if an employee requests to work remotely as an accommodation for a disability or as an accommodation for a religious practice, that those should be assessed under your policies having to do with reasonable accommodations, assuming, of course, that you're covered by these uh, anti-discrimination laws, um, which federally for disability is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and there's a state equivalent here in Oregon. Um, and for religion, it's Title VII. Um, and there's also a, a state equivalent here in Oregon. Um, so if you're covered by that, and you've got an employee making a request that might fringe on that even a bit, 
um, move away from considering their request under your remote work policy um, and instead put them in the right on the right path to um, engage in the interactive process and um, handle their their request that way um, so moving on another section in the policy um, that you would want to uh, lay out and this is especially where it really depends on what kind of workforce you have um, is setting out employee expectations um, so for instance are they going to be fully remote or are they going to have a hybrid schedule um, if hybrid uh, what days do you expect them to report to work um, should they be coming in with their team or do you want your entire workforce to be reporting to work on the same days um, are you going to permit remote employees to have a flexible work schedule, um, especially those, for instance, who are working maybe on the East Coast or out of the country? Um, are you going to have any sort of core work hours where they're expected to be available and working? Um, those are all things that you'll you'll need to assess, obviously, on a case by case basis with with different employees. Um, another. Thing to consider putting in your policy or at least consider for your your practices is um whether or not you might want to implement shared workspaces because of course if your entire workforce isn't coming in regularly um then maybe you don't need uh, the same in-office resources that you once had um so maybe you'll have employees who are hoteling by checking in and uh using desks on, on a shared basis if so, it might be a good idea to, to lay that out and give your employees notice of it in advance. Um, another consideration uh, really that uh, feeds into the first bullet point, which is um, just their accessibility during work hours. Um, to what extent when they're working remotely, do you want them to be accessible? Maybe it's um, on one end of the spectrum, um, they're on Teams or they're on Slack and they're uh, responding to messages quickly, like almost in real time. Um, or maybe it's more, you know, if they get a call from their supervisor, then they need to call back within an hour. Um, there are endless options. Um, and it, again, it of course depends on your workforce and your employees, um, but those are another, uh, that's another consideration to think about. Um, another expectation that would be good to set out in your policy is that uh, working remotely is of course not a replacement for employees um, having uh, child care issues or dependent care or pet care um, even though you know the, of course that's convenient and you might have a little overlap um, you don't want to get into into overlap situations like that so setting that expectation out is a good idea um, also, uh, you know, maybe you would like to implement a or maintain a dress code uh, for people who are working remotely. Um, if you have the type of workforce where employees are expected to jump on a Zoom call um, or a webinar quickly um, and be on camera, maybe you'd like to set the expectation that when they're working remotely, they're not just wearing, uh, you know, their underwear and laying in bed. They need to actually be presentable in the home. Um, another expectation and uh, to set out is that dealing with timekeeping and meal and rest breaks. So of course, you know, this doesn't apply to your um, exempt employees, but to the extent you have any non-exempt employees who are working from home, so those who are um, hourly um, and subject to uh, meal and rest break requirements and overtime requirements, um, it's a good idea to have a note of that in your policy or at least maybe a reference to your timekeeping policy. Um, because of course, under, uh, Oregon wage and hour law, employees are entitled to be compensated for all hours worked. When they're working remotely, of course, it's a little more difficult to see um, when and when they may not be working, when they may be taking their meal breaks and their rest breaks, and whether those are compliant. Um, so it's a good idea to remind them that they're expected to mind the timekeeping policies. Um, okay, so outside of ex employee expectations and um, that's by no means an exhaustive list. I mean, there may be expectations that are specific to your workforce. Um, but in addition to those, it's uh, nice to also give employees notice of your responsibilities or the agreements that you're willing to make with them um, about their remote work situation. Um, and so just a few for your consideration are um, what, ex uh, what equipment you might 
supply to them? Are you going to provide office furniture? Uh, you know, are you going to give them a desk? Um, those kinds of things. Um, technical support. Um, gosh, I rely on that so heavily. I can barely use Microsoft Word. <laughs> so, you know, having technical support for their, uh, their webcams and their internet service and their uh, virtual machines and access. Um, setting out what that is and, and giving them um, a line of support is a good thing to put in your policy as well. Um, and then this is not really something that I, I would encourage you necessarily to put into a written policy, but just a best practices reminder um, is that as an employer, you're responsible for enforcing your policies, even though they may be working remotely. Um, and so just as a, an example, an illustration, um, harassment that can occur outside of the physical workplace. Um, and so, you know, harassment can come in the form of uh, harassment by coworkers, supervisors, or even third parties if it's connected to their work, such as customers and clients that your employees are interfacing with. Um, as you know, those can all be sources of harassment and they don't need to be in person. They can be um, in the home. Um, I actually dealt with a case somewhat recently where all of the alleged harassment was occurring on Instagram, where employees uh, followed one another and were posting uh, very mean, <laughs> uh, like memes and photos, and then uh, making it very clear in the comments and the uh, caption that they were referring to certain coworkers, um, which those spread like wildfire. And uh, that was the, the basis for um, a harassment lawsuit. So, um, Basically, it's just a general reminder that the workplace policies apply, even if the employee's workplace is their home. Um, so uh, keeping that in mind. All right. So um, sort of relating back to the previous slide, which is what equipment will you provide as an employer? Um, another one is which expenses will you choose to reimburse? Um, and uh, of course, this is uh, covered by certain laws. Um, here, I just give you a quick sampling of Oregon, California, and Washington. But of course, if you have employees who are working in other jurisdictions, then uh, you'll need to look at those laws and see what applies to them specifically. Um, so I won't bother reading that all out because it's quite a bit of text. But um, as you can see, there is quite a bit of variety um, between them. And I will share with you an interesting case um, that uh, happened in California um, recently. Um, this was a federal lawsuit against Amazon. Um, so looking at the California standard first, just to get us all on the same page, um, California's labor code requires that uh, employers reimburse for any sort of necessary expenditures, including all reasonable costs um, and so what does that actually mean? Because <laughs> it's pretty vague. Um, well, um, down in California, um, a senior software engineer working for Amazon filed a lawsuit in federal court, and he alleged that Amazon failed to reimburse him for certain work-related expenses like his internet. Um, Amazon filed a motion to dismiss, and they raised a couple different arguments, but um, the one that I think is most pertinent for our discussion today is that uh, Amazon argued that because the employee did not submit any requests for reimbursement, they were off the hook. They didn't know that he had incurred any business expenses and so they weren't liable for them. Well, the court didn't take too kindly to that argument. Uh, they denied the motion to dismiss um, and they explained that Amazon is a tech company and the plaintiff, their, their employee, um, is a software engineer. So Amazon, you know, should reasonably know that his do job duties as a software engineer will require the use of um, some physical space and he'll need to have internet and he'll need to have electricity in order to do his job. Um, so even if he didn't submit a reimbursement request to Amazon, Amazon either knew or they had reason to know that he was incurring those uh, basic costs. Um, so they were not off the hook um, just because he didn't request it. Um, so then uh, 
you know, in California, basic costs can be internet usage, personal cell phone, laptops, and even some utilities. Um, there are also have been some, some recent uh, activity where employees are seeking uh, reimbursement for furniture, rent, um, and even their meals in cases where they have employers who um, provide like snacks in the physical workplace. So um, I mentioned that obviously, you know, we're not physically here in California, but um, I know a lot of you uh, have work sites in California, you have employees in California, um, and it also just helps illustrate that this is a, a fact intensive thing, um, what kind of expenses you might be on the hook for reimbursing. Um, and so it's a good idea to have that clear uh, policy in place and practice. Um, all right, so moving on. Um, this is more of, um, again, like a best practices uh, highlight for you. Um, you don't necessarily need to include this in a remote work policy, but you might make reference to it if you like. Um, and that is remote work injuries. So um, remote workers are still eligible for workers' compensation. And that's because um, workers' compensation applies to any injury or illness that occurs um, in the course of employment. Well, of course, if your employees are working from home, they can occur in the course of employment. Um, same goes for reporting, injury reporting requirements for OSHA. Um, as a reminder to you all, Oregon has its own um, OSHA as well, um, and other states do too. Um, so you'll want to be mindful of that. Um, and you might be wondering, well, how could they possibly get injured when they're, you know, sitting on their couch with their golden retriever wearing their pajamas on their laptop? Well, um, OSHA actually gave a couple of examples of um, what is and is not considered work-related. Um, so a work-related injury might be if an employee is carrying a heavy box of documents in their home and they drop the box of documents and it falls on their foot and hurts their foot. There you have a work-related injury. Um, Another example they gave is uh, an employee who is rushing through the home to answer a work call because they hear their phone ringing and they trip over the family dog and get hurt. OSHA says that's not work related. Um, and they didn't really give a whole lot of um, illustration as to why, but I might speculate that because even though you're rushing or the employee was rushing to answer a work call, uh, you know, the family dog is not typically a, a work-related hazard <laughs> um, and something more specific to the home. Um, another example they gave of something that is not work-related um, is an employee who is electrocuted by faulty home wiring. Um, and I found that interesting because just a moment ago when we were talking about reimbursements for work expenses, um, we talked about how California basic costs include internet and uh, cell phone, laptop, and uh, some utilities, which includes electricity. So, you know, there's a little bit of a divergence there. On the one hand, those are uh, work-related uh, basic costs in California that should be reimbursed. But on the other hand, uh, you know, if you get electrocuted from <laughs> your electricity at home, that's not considered work-related for purposes of OSHA injury reporting. Um, okay, so enough about that. Um, let's just move on here to the end, which is some additional policy considerations um, that you might want to make reference to in your remote work policy, um, or just things for you to think about as you're updating your handbooks and your other policies, which is um, a bring your own device policy. Um, that one can set clear expectations for employees about using um, company resources or their own devices and the extent to which they overlap. Um, obviously, that's quite relevant for the remote work setting. Um, outside employment, um, you know, maybe you've got some remote work employees who, uh, you know, log off and go drive for Lyft or Uber or do a DoorDash to make a little extra cash on the side. Um, you know, you might have some, some issues there. Um, so having reference to your outside employment policy or putting one in place um, so that you, you have the opportunity to correct that kind of behavior if it comes up um, is also a good idea. Um, making sure that your confidentiality and trade secrets um, and relatedly your information security policies are up to date um, and tightened up. Um, of course, when you have employees using company resources at home, like their computers and their cell phones, um, those issues really come into play. 
Um, and then finally, a reminder that um, all of the notices that employers are required to physically post in the workplace, um, you know, when you have fully remote employees who aren't able to come into the workplace, place and see those things, um, employers are still responsible for making sure they get those notices. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you that it depends on the jurisdiction. Um, in large part, those can just be emailed to the employee. That's pretty easy. Um, but some still require that uh, a physical copy is received, in which case, of course, you can just mail them to the employee's home. But it's worth looking into where are my employees? What notices do I need to give them? And how do I need to get them to them? <laughs> Just to make sure you're fully compliant. Um, so that was a nice big survey. And I know that was a lot of content about all the different policy considerations that you might put into place for your remote workers. Um, and then now we're just going to touch on um, a related topic just briefly, which is um, some jurisdictional issues that come up with remote employees. Um, and so for instance, which laws apply to remote employees? Well, um, it honestly depends on the particular law and the rule um, and court and agency interpretations. Um, it might not seem all that clear, um, especially when you have an employer in one location and an employee in another and work being performed possibly in another jurisdiction. Um, so, you know, at the at the risk of going down a rambling path of a, a pretty complicated area, I just do want to flag for you that um, that can be a very specific inquiry depending on the law. Um, so it's important to assess each remote employee's circumstances to figure out which laws apply to them so that you're uh, following those. Um, and then on a related note, um, remember to properly count your remote employees. Um, so for example, uh, the FMLA defines a work site um, as the employer's office to which the employee reports and from which assignments are made, uh, not the remote employee's personal residence. Um, so this is important when determining whether a remote employee is eligible to receive benefits under FEMLA and whether um, a certain work site counts um, as FEMLA covered. Um, you need to make sure that you're counting those employees within that properly um, and not relying on their home being uh, a work site because it's not. Um, same goes for the WARN Act. Um, so this uh, federal law applies when employees do uh, shutdowns or layoffs um, and need to provide notice to their employees of that um, and various other requirements that are way beyond the scope of today. Um, similar to FEMLA, um, the single site of employment, which is um, related to the location, um, it's the location to which the employee is assigned as their home base from which their work is assigned or to which they report. Again, not their home itself. Um, so those are just a few things to keep in mind for your remote employees. Um, and then finally, uh, related to jurisdiction, um, is work from anywhere. Um, this is different than work from home because uh, this applies to employees who choose to maybe travel to some fabulous locale um, or you know, head to another state. Um, I've heard about employees not informing their employers and just moving to a completely different state and had been working there for a while and the employer had no idea. Um, they're also... Uh, I heard of an employee moving to London and didn't tell their employer. Um, and then, you know, on the other end of the, the spectrum, the, the sort of the vacation side, and I've even seen the term workcation. I don't know if that one's going to take off, but it's out there. Workcation. Um, employees going to fun destinations. So, um, you know, for instance, heading off to Palm Springs for a month to work remotely. Um, just like on the previous slide when we talked about there's a fact intensive inquiry, which laws apply to which employee based on where they're working, where their work is being felt um, or you know, where it's being done. Um, and then where the employer is based, um, this really comes into play if they're working internationally or in a different state that you uh, don't have a business location in. So um, 
for your policy, or at least in your practice, um, you may want to address work from anywhere with your workforce. Um, you may want to consider limiting the locations where employees can work. Um, so for instance, you might want to limit them to jurisdictions where you already have a business presence. So if you have an office in California, employees can work remotely in California but you don't have a, any sort of business presence in New York. So you don't want employees going there and having to get into the weeds on all of the New York employment laws that might cover them. Um, so limiting locations. Um, another is limiting the time that they work in certain locations and uh, having mechanisms to track that time. Um, again, just to help curtail your potentially being covered by countless employment laws. Um, you may want to make clear that employees who are traveling around to work from anywhere are responsible for their own shipping costs and providing their own equipment um, so that that's not on the company dime. Um, of course, like we talked about earlier, work schedule in different time zones if they're in an international location or far away. Um, another is making clear that employees are responsible for their own transportation, meals, lodging, just making it absolutely clear to them that although they may be traveling to go work in a remote location, that travel is not a business expense. Um, another being that the travel should be done in non-work hours. So they're not on the clock when they do that travel. Um, and then also uh, for any sort of employees who are uh, working in different jurisdictions, um, making clear that you as their employer are not responsible for and not giving them any tax advice and that they should be consulting their own tax advisor um, for issues about their, their jurisdiction. So um, that does it. Uh, I know that was quite a bit, um, but of course, if you have questions and are wanting to fine tune your policies or put a new policy or employment agreement in place, um, recommend that you reach out to your legal counsel. And uh, with that, I will uh, say farewell for Olivia and for me. And next up is uh, Jordan, who will be uh, presenting on paid family leave. Thank you.